Laboratory Learning, facilitator from St. Mary's Senior High. In our last lesson, we went through some aspects of the chief examiner's report, and one area that we noticed we will have to at, uh, actually emphasize is on the completion of the syllabus, as well as looking at gray areas where questions haven't been coming from for quite a number of years now. So today, we want to look at some of the topics that most often students are not able to do, and they go and write their WASI. To help us do that this evening, we've decided to look at three areas for today's class. So we shall be looking at execution, that will be working on a, a topic on organic chemistry. Then we'll look at questions and answers, after which we'll have our problem of the day. So today's class will be divided into three segments. The first part will be the concept of organic chemistry, an introduction, and then in our next class, we'll continue and finish. And then after, we will also move on to the questions and answers. Then we'll have our problem of the day. At this juncture, I will encourage you to call a friend and a call, a, call other friends so that we can all sit by our television and learn. We are preparing to write the YC and we all want to do well. So enjoy learning, keep learning. So today, like I said, we'll be doing organic chemistry and our learning objectives for today's class will be at the end of this lesson, you, my favorite learners, will be able to one, define organic chemistry, state examples and their sources, state the importance of organic chemistry, and three, define hydrocarbons and state examples, define functional groups and state examples, define and state the properties of arcane. So today we are going to have a packed class. We shall be treating the first portion of organic chemistry, and in our last episode, we shall finish the organic chemistry. So to start with, we want to look at organic chemistry. Many years ago, it was thought that compounds classified as organic were made only by living things. And this uh, notion lingered on for a long time until a scientist by name Friedrich Wohler, somewhere in 1826, 1822, 1826, thereabouts, synthesized urea. By that time, urea was well known, somewhere from the 1700s, but they didn't know that it could be synthesized in a lab. So the notion of organic compounds produced only by living things was broken. And that bet synthesis and so many compounds have been produced since then till date. So the question is, what therefore is organic chemistry? And if we are saying that it could be produced in a lab, what therefore are the sources of organic compounds? So we start by saying that organic chemistry is the study of carbon compounds, except carbon four oxide, metallic carbonate, metallic hydrogen carbonate, cyanide. So if they ask you to define organic chemistry, it is the study of carbon compounds except carbon four oxide, metallic carbonate, metallic hydrogen carbonate, and cyanide. These species that we mentioned, that they are deceptions, are considered to be inorganic. So why should we even study organic chemistry. You see, on a periodic table, there are so many elements, and I'm sure by now you know all the 118, because most often when students are asked to state how many elements they know, they still mention the first 20, so by now I expect that you, are, you know at least the first 50 or the first 40. But if you look at all the elements on the periodic table, they form their respective compounds. However, carbon alone forms more compounds than all of them put together. So it means that we need to give carbon an attention. It doesn't mean that the other elements don't have their attention. We have various aspects of chemistry. So carbon compounds and their study is what we call organic chemistry. But not all compounds containing carbon are organic. So we say that organic chemistry is the study of carbon compounds except carbon four oxide, metallic carbonate, metallic hydrogen carbonate, and cyanide. So these species are inorganic in nature. However, the compounds studied are what we call the organic compounds. So we can say that organic compounds are compounds of carbon except carbon four oxide, metallic carbonate, 
metallic hydrogen carbonate, what some people call metallic bicarbonate, as well as cyanide. And those ones are classified as inorganic. So let's look at some examples of organic compounds. So with examples, there are so many compounds or so many things around us which are classified as organic. The things that we could come across showing on your screen are proteins. We've all been eating and we are adding on and we are adding on matter to our body. So uh, we keep changing in size, okay? So we say that we are growing. Growth is an irreversible increase in size and growth of an organism. So protein is one of them. Vinegar, we've been using vinegar to clean our fruits and vegetables. It's an organic material, fats and oil, all right? Domestic gas, we've been using gas to cook. That compound that we burn in our kitchen to generate heat so that food could be cooked, uh, what we call domestic gas. There are so many types, there are different types. We also have nylon, these plastic materials around us. And um, we can have ethanol, ethanol, I hope it rings a bell. Uh, that drink that people have been consuming, even though it is not healthy all the time. Then we can have carbohydrates as well as plastics. So like I said, organic compounds are so many, we cannot list all of them, but a few are what we've given you. Proteins, you can have your nylon, you can have carbohydrates, fats and oils, all right, ethanol, vinegar, and you can keep mentioning those polymers around you. So let's look at sources of organic compounds. Where do we get organic compounds? So like I said earlier, it was first thought that you could get them only from living things. But now, it can be synthesized in the lab and industrially, it can be produced on large scale. So where then do we get these organic compounds? This means we can have the naturally occurring organic compounds and we can have the synthetic ones, the one produced in the lab or at the industry. At the Organic, at the naturally occurring level, we can have organic compounds present in coal, all right, coal. Coal is a sedimentary deposition of carbon, all right, that is dark in nature. It's a sedimentary deposition of carbon in rocks, so it can easily be mined and used directly. It is highly inflammable, and it can be a source of energy. We can also get... Um, organic compounds from crude oil, crude oil, that viscous dark brown mixture, all right, of hydrocarbons and other compounds, which normally we get them from the bellies of the earth. Now, by the grace of God, Ghana, we have a place at Cape Three Point where we are now getting a crude oil, all right, so crude oil or petroleum. Now, we can also get it from natural gas. This is a highly inflammable gas, usually trapped, it's made up of a mixture of hydrocarbons trapped all right, somewhere under the earth. And it can also be tapped in and used as a source of fuel. So you can use it with power generators and you can even use it to cook. So if these are the sources of organic compounds at the natural level, then what are the importance or the importances of the study of carbon compounds? All right, is it important to study carbon compounds? So we want to look at the importance of the study of carbon compounds. So carbon forms so many compounds, like I said, with itself and other elements found on the periodic table. Interestingly, the compounds of carbon doesn't seem to have an end. Every day, more compounds are being synthesized and produced, and they have their unique properties, all right, which we can exploit to our benefit. So because it can form so many compounds with itself and other elements found on the periodic table, it is important to study um, carbon compounds. Now, the compounds can be found in both living and non-living things, and hence essential to life, because we need them, all right? So if we can, we can study organic chemistry and we can study carbon compounds because of its ability to form so many compounds, then what about the property of carbon? That is so important to us. So let's look at properties of carbon that makes it form many compounds. What is about carbon alone? That allows it to form so many compounds. And every day, scientists all over the world are still publishing new compounds every now and then. So carbon forms so many compounds because, one, carbon can form covalent bonds with itself, all right, to form stable straight or branch chains or ring compounds containing many carbons. So you could have carbon forming straight chains. So here you could have carbon forming a bond for another carbon 
another bond, and it keeps going. Or you could have it also branch, all right? So you have a carbon, a carbon, and you have branches. And as a result of this ability of carbon to form compounds, we have so many compounds all over the world made from carbon alone. So carbon can form covalent bonds with itself to form stable states, branch, or ring compounds containing many atoms. So it's not only straight chain, what we call the aliphatics, but you can also have the aromatics, all right, or what you call the alicyclic. We'll be talking about some of them as we move further. Another property about carbon that helps it to form so many compounds is that it has the ability to form single, double, and triple bonds with itself, all right? So you can have carbon having the ability to form single, double, or triple covalent bonds with other carbon atoms and with atoms of other elements. So in most compounds or, organ or organic compounds in nature, you will see carbon forming a single bond with itself. You also see carbon forming a double bond with another carbon. So here you have one carbon, you have another carbon. They form a covalent bond and they are moving together. All right, we said a covalent bond is the bond formed between two or more atoms as a result of sharing of electrons. So when they form the bond, they move together. Similarly, you can also find a double bond formed between one carbon and another carbon. And these are properties of carbon that helps it to form so many compounds. And the last one is that carbon equally can form a triple bond with another carbon. So you can have a triple bond formed between two carbons in a compound. And when you have this level of double or um, triple bond, what you call unsaturation, it exposes the compound to so many reactions. So you can end up forming so many compounds from carbon alone or carbon compounds alone. Carbon has the ability to form very long chain. So you can find so many atoms of carbon forming one long chain. And that ability to form that long chain is what you call catenation. It's called catenation. So we call it catenation. And carbon can form four covalent bonds around itself. And this is what we call tetravalency. Tetravalency. Because carbon has four electrons on this atomous cell. It can use the four electrons on this atomous cell to form covalent bonds with four different atoms, to form single covalent bond with four different atoms, so that it will have a stable outer electronic configuration. So these are the properties of carbon that enables it to form so many compounds. One, it forms single, double, and triple bond with other carbon. It can form long chains with other carbons, all right? And that is what we call the catenation. And then carbon forms single bonds with other atoms, and that is what we call tetravalency. So if these are the properties of carbon that enable us to form so many compounds, then we want to take a step back and find out whether we have differences between organic compounds, or organic chemistry, and inorganic compounds, or inorganic chemistry. The differences between organic and inorganic compounds are varied. That means that you can have so many differences between organic compounds and inorganic compounds. But the table below shows the differences between organic and inorganic compounds. So we summarize a few differences between organic and inorganic compounds. Let us look at them briefly on your screen. So showing on your wonderful screen is a, two, is a, is a table, all right, a two column table showing the differences between the organic compounds and the inorganic compounds. We started by saying that organic compounds are compounds containing carbon, with the exception of carbon four oxide, metallic carbonate, metallic bicarbonate, or metallic hydrogen carbonate, as well as cyanide. So what is common in all organic compounds, therefore, should be carbon, all right? But you will not find that all the time in inorganic compounds. So one difference between them is that carbon is always present for organic compounds, but for the inorganic, Carbon is not always present. So you can have compounds made from other elements and there will be no carbon in there, all right? So the second difference is that carbon compounds are volatile, all right? They are volatile. And then the inorganic ones are less volatile, all right? They easily change into a gas. So we say they are volatile. 
And the inorganic ones, they don't easily change into a gas. So you can leave stable salt. It will only absorb water from the environment, but it will not change into a gas unless the temperature is highly raised and the conditions are right for it to do so. Then the other difference between organic compounds and the inorganic compounds is that their reactions are very slow. Organic compounds react, inorganic compounds also react. But if you compare their rates of reactions, you see that organic compounds are less reactive compared to the inorganic ones. However, there are exceptions. There are certain compounds in uh, organic chemistry which are equally fast when it comes to their time rate of reaction. So the difference, another difference between them is that the organic compounds are less reactive as compared to the inorganic compounds. Well, another difference that we have on your screen is that they have low melting point, whereas the inorganic compounds have high melting point. Melting point is the constant temperature at which a substance changes from a solid to a liquid or vice versa, all right? Now, it takes a very low temperature, all right, to change an organic substance into a liquid. So when you heat it, it will easily melt. So you notice that when you apply small heat to rubber, all right, the nylon materials around us or the PVC or the if ethylene compounds around us, they easily melt. But if you take a compound made from uh, maybe magnesium and sulfate or magnesium sulfide or probably even rust, all right, ion three oxide, and you heat it, nothing happens because it has a very high melting point. So inorganic compounds have high melting points. Then we can also look at the kind of bond between them. Organic compounds are mostly covalent compounds, all right? They are compounds formed as a result of sharing of electrons, whereas the inorganic ones are mostly ionic compounds. They are compounds formed by the total transfer of electrons from one atom to the other. So we can look at the difference between organic and inorganic compounds as by comparing the type of bond they form, all right? Then the very last one we have on the table here is organic compounds are usually less soluble in water, but the inorganic ones are mostly soluble in water. It doesn't mean that all inorganic compounds are soluble. Most of the salts we see in inorganic chemistry are not soluble in water, all right? Uh -huh. So we don't expect all of them, but most of the organic compounds will not dissolve in water, except a few, all right, through hydrogen bonding. So we can look at the differences between organic compounds and inorganic compounds by always looking at the presence or absence of carbon, all right, presence or absence of carbon. Then you can talk about volatility, all right, volatility. Organic compounds are very volatile. The inorganic compounds are less volatile. And the time rate of reaction, organic compounds react slowly as compared to the inorganic one, all right? Then the last one, you can also look at melting point or even boiling point. The all organic compounds have low melting and boiling point, even as far as even flash point, the minimum temperature at which substances catches fire, okay? So they have very low physical properties compared to the inorganic uh, compounds. And the last one is on the solubility or the type of bond formed by them. So we have clearly defined the differences between organic and inorganic compounds. So if you go to your exam hall and you are given a question like, state two differences between organic and inorganic compounds, it shouldn't be a problem now because you have been taught. And we thank Joy Learning for bringing this information to you. So let's move on to importance of organic chemistry in industrialization. We said that organic compounds occur naturally. However, they can also be produced in the lab through synthesis. And we can also produce them on large scale industrially. So let's look at the importance of organic chemistry in industrialization. Organic compounds serve as the raw materials for the manufacturing of many industrial products. So it is so important to industry, all right? Through the knowledge of organic chemistry and sources of organic compounds, most industries are able to operate successfully. So it means that without organic compounds, we cannot have industrialization. We cannot have industries uh, operating successfully. And we will not also have the manufacturing of new products. So you will not see new things around you. So um, organic chemistry and the knowledge of organic compounds is very, very key to industrialization.
They also have their challenges when it comes to environmental issues. When we get there, we'll be talking about them. But this knowledge helps industries to produce. So you see, the knowledge is important to the industry. The raw material is also important to the industry. Now, why are they important to the industry? We want to look at what they use this information and the raw materials for. So the knowledge helps industries to produce pharmaceutical drugs. So sometimes we just walk, all right? When you are not well, we go to the hospital, they diagnose, they do all the tests and other things, and then they tell us, oh, go to the pharmacy shop, then they write prescription, then they give you the medication. Now those compounds that we have been, we have been swallowing happily, all right, are what you call the pharmaceutical drugs, and most of them come from the organic source, all right? Now they are also used in industrial chemicals such as paint, detergents, and acids. All right, so we need them to produce paint. We need them also to produce detergents, and we also need them to produce acids. It's not only that fertilizer is always associated with uh, crude oil. So anytime you have the production of crude or some or the man or the removal of crude somewhere, you can also have materials associated with that, and that helps us to produce fertilizer. And remember. Fertilizer is needed by the agricultural sector to fertilize soils for plants to grow, and then we can get higher yield because of the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium present in the fertilizers. Now, this knowledge also helps industries to produce fuels for internal combustion engines. These days, we have all sorts of cars and other machines around. Without fuels, most of them are operated using fuels, but now technology is working around the clock to move from these fuels to electricity. So at the industrial level, organic chemistry helps in the production of fuels. Now we have spoken a lot about organic compounds, organic chemistry, importance of the study of organic compounds or uh, carbon, how or why carbon compounds are of importance to industry. Let us zoom further into what we call hydrocarbon. So when we take organic chemistry, it has so many branches. In fact, it's so broad that uh, it will take a long time to study everything. But at the SHS level, it has been summarized all right, for the integrated science. And the science students will tell you that it's very broad. But even at the SHS level, it's heavily summarized. Okay, So we shall start by looking at some of the branches of uh, organic chemistry. Okay, And then we'll move on from there. We shall start right away with hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, the word hydrocarbon comes from two words, hydrogen and carbon. So we say that these are com organic compounds which consist of carbon and hydrogen only. So if you have a compound that contains a carbon, a hydrogen, and another element, that is not a hydrocarbon. For example, glucose is not a hydrocarbon. Thiophen is also not a hydrocarbon, all right, because in addition to the carbon and hydrogen, they contain oxygen. In the case of glucose, you have oxygen. By entirely, you have sulfur. So that means that those compounds are not hydrocarbons. So we say that it is a word, all right? It is a word that comes from two words, hydrogen and carbon. And they are generally denoted by CXHY, where X is the number of carbon and Y the number of corresponding hydrogen atoms. So what we mean here is this. We have a class of compounds called organic compounds. Now, under organic compounds, we have sections, all right? We have various sections. Just like human beings, we are all human beings, but we have tribes. Similarly, under the organic chemistry or the organic compounds, we have groups, of, all right? We have grouping that separates one from the other. And they are grouped because they have a set of similar character, all right, or characteristics. So here, Hydrocarbons are called hydrocarbons because they contain carbon and hydrogen only, and they all have the general molecular formula CXHY as shown on your screen. And the X stands for the number of carbons in the given compound. And so far as you have X as the number of carbons in that compound, you have a corresponding Y number of hydrogen. So for every X number of carbon, you have Y number of what? Hydrogens. As you move further, you see that the X and the Y will be different from the other forms of hydrocarbons, like the arcanes, the arkenes, and the arkynes. All right, so we say that the hydrocarbons have the general molecular formula CXHY, 
and the X stands for the number of carbons as well as Y being the number of hydrogen. But remember, hydrocarbon is just one class of organic compounds. And even under hydrocarbon, we have other classes. We'll be looking at it. Then as, ta as time goes on, or if time permits, we'll be looking at the other branches, all right, of um, organic compounds. So let's look at types of hydrocarbons. Types of hydrocarbons. Well, there are like I said earlier, there are different types of hydrocarbon, and uh, the syllabus restricts our study to these three. But we have other forms. We have to uh, acknowledge that we have other forms. But at the SHS Integrated Science level, we have our canes, our kings, and our kinds as shown on your screen. So look at the spellings carefully. Our canes, our kings, our kinds. They sound similar, up, but you have the ains, you have the ins, and you have the ains, okay? And these are all hydrocarbons, but they are all different. Okay, that is why I said that under the hydrocarbon, we have three classes, all right, and we're looking at them. So let's look at classification of hydrocarbons. So we have our canes, we have our kings, and we have our kinds. So the types of hydrocarbons can be classified as either saturated hydrocarbon or unsaturated hydrocarbon. You see the uh, various branches that we cited? So for the hydrocarbons, we have our case, our kings, our kinds. Now these compounds can either be classified as saturated or unsaturated. Now when we say a compound is saturated, then the carbons in the compound are surrounded by four single covalent bonds. That means that all the carbons are satisfied in terms of the octets, and that makes them less reactive. But those that are not totally surrounded, that makes them more reactive. So let's look at these classifications. So we have saturated hydrocarbon and the unsaturated hydrocarbon. So the classification is based on their functional groups, all right, on their functional groups and the presence of multiple bonds. So if you have a hydrocarbon, you look at the functional group, and if the functional group has multiple bonds, then it is unsaturated. We'll be looking at them one after the other. So let's start right away with saturated hydrocarbons. Saturated hydrocarbons. So we start by saying that these are hydrocarbons whose carbons are all surrounded by the maximum of four single covalent bonds. So you have a, a hydrocarbon or you have an organic compound. That organic compound contains carbon and hydrogen only. That makes it a hydrocarbon. Now you went to, the, to look at what is inside the compound. Yes, you have carbons. Yes, you have hydrogen. But you notice that all the carbons in the compound are surrounded by four single covalent bonds to other atoms. Then we say that that compound is a saturated hydrocarbon. The carbons have used all their valence electrons to form single covalent bonds with other carbons or hydrogen atoms, all right? With other carbons or hydrogen atoms. So on your wonderful screen, we have our canes as saturated hydrocarbons. In fact, of all the three hydrocarbons we listed, the arcanes, the arcanes, and the arcanes, it's only arcanes which are saturated. Arcanes and arcanes are unsaturated because they are multiple bonds, all right? And that makes them more susceptible to reactions. So for the arcanes, they all have carbons with the structure below. So if you look, if you open the structure up, you will notice that every carbon in an arcane is always surrounded by four single covalent bonds. So we are looking at these bonds. And the reason is that carbon has four electrons on this outermost cell. Carbon must have minimum of eight electrons on this outermost cell to be stable. So to achieve that, it's going to share those four electrons on this outermost cell with other atoms who are in need, all right? So you have hydrogen, normally forms a bond with hydrogen or carbon or sometimes other elements. So they all have these bonds around them. And the bond is what we have used the dash to represent. So anytime you look at um, an organic compound and you see a dash, it means it's a pair of electrons shared between two um, atoms. So in this example we have here, we have carbon surrounded by these single bonds, and it's because every bond here is a pair of electrons, and that makes the carbon uh, stable. So you should have other atoms at the end here. So for example, we have methane, all right, and the structure for methane is shown. So for example, methane has a structure 
a carbon hydrogen carbon hydrogen carbon hydrogen but if you condense the structure or condense the formula for every carbon you have four hydrogen atoms so we write the carbon and write the number of hydrogens surrounding it. so we have one carbon and then you have four hydrogen atoms right so you have four hydrogen atoms but you can also have two carbons and you have six hydrogen atoms all right so you can have six hydrogen atoms i'm trying to remember it's not coming so here we can have four carbons and six hydrogen atoms okay so let's look at um, the, the drawing so you have a carbon c2 you can have h6 and that means you have a carbon a carbon all right and collectively they are surrounded by six hydrogens you have a hydrogen here a hydrogen there a hydrogen a hydrogen and a hydrogen and if you watch every carbon every carbon is surrounded by four bonds so this is the first one all right so we have this bond showing uh, and the first one is this then followed by the second one followed by the third one and the fourth one and the same applies to this the second one the third one and the fourth one so we say that the carbons there are saturated all right the carbons there are saturated so you can have arcanes and for arcanes they, every carbon in the compound is surrounded by four single covalent bond now so i cited ethane i didn't even know that it's part of the slide here so ethane and propane have the structures below respectively so we are going to look at their structures and in a, this is ethane, the one I drew earlier, is the same as this. And you notice that for every carbon here, it's surrounded by four single covalent bonds. So if you are counting from the top clockwise, you have one, two, three, four. And for this one, if you are counting from the top clockwise, you have one, two, three, four. The bond between them is common to each carbon. So when you are counting it, it should be counted for each carbon, all right? So you have four single covalent bonds. And that compound here is called ethane ethane all right so in terms of the condensed structure we can have ch3 ch3 or if you recondense it then you can have your c2 h6 all right so ca3 this is the first ca3 and that is the next ca3 and if you recondense it then you are going to have the um, c2 h6 all right the c2 h6 the same applies to our friend here called propane, all right, propane. Propane, I'll be showing you how we came across or how we named the compound, so don't panic at all, it's very easy, you can, very, you can easily do it when we finish. But prop, meaning three carbon compound, and each carbon here is surrounded also by four single covalent bonds. So you have one, you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So all of them are surrounded by four single covalent bonds. And per the structure that we have there, you see that when it was condensed, we had the, we had the first group that is a CA3, and that is the first CA3. Then you have this one, the CA2, that is the CA2. Then you also have another CA3, that is the next CA3. So when you draw the structure, you can condense it, and you can even further open it up. All right, you can further open it up. So for this, you can also write C3H8, all right, C3, because you have three carbons in the compound, and if you add all the hydrogens, you will get eight hydrogens, all right? You, you can also write C3H8. All right, so we move on to other parts. So it's not only methane, ethane or propane you can have butane you can have pentane hexane heptane and on and on and on so we move on to the unsaturated unsaturated hydrocarbons so we said earlier that where you have a hydrocarbon and you have multiple bonds then that hydrocarbon is not a saturated hydrocarbon we can therefore call that hydrocarbon an unsaturated hydrocarbon the carbons all carbons in the compound are not surrounded by four single covalent bonds it means you could have some being four single covalent bonds but you have some with multiple bonds between them and since they are multiple bonds they are unsaturated so we say that 
These are hydrocarbons containing carbon chains in which one or some of the carbons are covalently bonded to other carbons with multiple bonds. So you could have one or some. It's not always every atom of carbon in the compound, but you have at least one. So for us, you have a double or a triple bond between one carbon and another or a carbon, and then we say that it is unsaturated. The multiple bonds could be double or triple, all right? The multiple bonds could be double or triple bond, as we said earlier. So let's look at examples of unsaturated hydrocarbons. And from what we've been saying all this while, we can easily say that uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons comes in the form of the arkenes and the arkynes. The arkenes, they have the double bond, all right? And the arkynes, they have the triple bond. So if you go into structure, we see that every arkene has a double bond. We'll be talking about functional groups in the GFE. So we have arkenes, and then we can also have the arkynes. Now, arkenes have at least one double bond, all right, between two carbons in their carbon chain. So you could have a carbon chain, very long carbon chain, very, very long, going, going, going. Then you will find a double bond somewhere. So far as there's a double bond somewhere in the compound, we say the compound is unsaturated, but the double bond makes it an arkene. So arkenes are different from arkenes, all right? They are different from arkenes, and we'll be looking at their nomenclature and their properties as we move further in this concept or journey of organic chemistry. Now, they may have unsaturated carbon, but at least there will be one double bond in the compound. So it means that you cannot classify a compound as um, unsaturated if you don't have any double bonds in it. And if it's not even, uh, if it doesn't have multiple bonds in it, and if it, it doesn't have, that means it is a saturated hydrocarbon. But if you have double bond or triple bond, then it makes it unsaturated hydrocarbon. So we have on our screen, a wonderful screen, an Akin's double bond, all right? And we say that an Akin's double bond is shown below. So every Akin has two carbons, all right, separated by a double bond, at least two carbons separated by a double bond. And you notice that uh, there are other projections from the carbon at angles. They are not straight, okay? Um, there are reasons for that. And um, we are not supposed to do detailed chemistry, but the science students, we are supposed to learn everything because they are sp2 hybridized. Um, so you should read more about it. So an example of an arkene is a thin, a thin, all right, a thin, what they use in preparing polythene. Yeah, so when we start talking about polymerization, you appreciate it. So we have a thin and propene. So remember for the arkenes, we mentioned methane, we mentioned ethane, then we also mentioned propane. We can also have butane, all right, pentane, hexane, heptane, and on and on and on. So for the arkenes, the starting or the simplest arkene is a thin. We don't have methane because you need at least two carbons. And when you have two carbons, it becomes a thin, all right, or a thin. So with their structures shown below respectively. So for the a thin, you have two carbons, all right, you have two carbons separated by a double bond. And those two carbons are also covalently bonded to other two hydrogens. So you have two carbons covalently bonded by a double bond, and each carbon is also bonded to a hydrogen, and the same carbon is bonded to another hydrogen, like we have in the case of the ethene. All right, this is ethene. Then if you move on to the condensed formula or the condensed structure, you are going to have CA2 because this portion you have a carbon, all right, you have this carbon. So you have this carbon, that is that one, and the two hydrogens here are the hydrogens we see there. The double bond are the bonds between the carbon. They are not between the hydrogens, but when we are writing, normally we write like this. But in reality, the hydrogens would have come here. So you should have the double bond between the two carbons. And for this same carbon, we have that carbon there, and it's covalently bonded to two different hydrogens. And these are the hydrogens, all right? So we have these hydrogens. Now, if we move on to the next one, we can also say that the compound called propene, propene also has its own properties, okay? Prop meaning three carbon compound uh, in terms of the, prefix, the Latin prefix. So you have a carbon, 
another carbon, another carbon. But you notice that only two out of the three carbons, all right, are unsaturated. The last one, which I circled here, is saturated because it's surrounded by four single covalent bonds. If you open the structure up, you will see that you have three carbons and then there's a fourth bond. This is the fourth bond between the carbon and another carbon that is unsaturated. But it makes the whole compound unsaturated hydrocarbon. And in this case, we are looking at our kings. Our kings are characterized by a double bond. We will treat our kings as a topic and we'll treat it as we move on. So if you condense the structure further, you are going to have CH2. This CH2 is coming from here, this carbon and the two hydrogens. Then we have another CH, all right, it should be CH. You have this C, this carbon here, and um, the other carbon. So you have this hydrogen coming from here, and then you have this carbon also coming from the last one here, okay? But the, the last carbon here is supposed to be three, not two, it's supposed to be three. So you have CH2, CH, CH3, all right? So you have CH2, CH, CH3. So the structure should look like C, this, CH2, then you have a CH, then you have a CH3, all right? Remember the double bond is somewhere here between the two carbons. All right, so we move on. I want to say that our kinds, all right, have at least one triple bond between two carbons in their carbon chain. Remember, our kings don't have any multiple or they don't have double or triple bond. Our, ki our kings have one double bond, but our kinds, they show triple bonds between two carbons in the organic compound. They may have saturated carbons, but at least there will be one double bond, one double, one triple bond, all right, there should be one triple bond um, in the compound, all right, in the compound. So we can move on to, and our kinds triple bond is shown below. All our kinds have triple bonds. Remember, all these structures we are talking about are types of what? Hydrocarbons, our kings, our kings, our kinds. So we've taken time to distinguish between our kings, our kings, and now we are on our kinds. Our kinds have triple bonds. Our kings, they have double bonds. And the triple bond of a typical our kind is shown on the screen. So we are looking at this, all right? You have two carbons with a, with a triple bond between them. There are three bonds between the two carbons. And collectively uh, and individually, they also have single bonds with other um, atoms, all right? Either univalent or whichever atom available. So an example of an arkene, all right, an example of an arkene is ethane, ethane. And you can have propyne, all right? Propyne with their structures shown below respectively. So this is the ethane, and that is the propyne. So we have the ethane, and then we have the propyne, all right? Ethane has two carbons, and the two carbons are separated by three, trip, or three bonds. Then the individual carbons are also covalently bonded to two different, uh, sorry, to, uh, to a different hydrogen atom. Right, so you have one bond here and another bond there. In the case of propyne, these carbons are unsaturated, but the third one here is saturated. All right, it is saturated. So the above class of compounds are different because they have a group of covalently bonded atoms that make them unique. All right, and these atoms or group of atoms are collectively called functional groups. So you notice that for the hydrocarbons that we have just treated, we've been able to isolate our kings from our kings and our kings from our kinds because our kings don't have multiple bonds. Our kings have double bonds and our kinds, they have triple bonds. So it means that for a class of compounds, they have a group of covalently bonded atoms which are unique to them. Others don't have it and we give them a name. So our kings are a class of compounds they don't have what you call a functional group, but they are characterized by the carbon-carbon single bond. And our kings, they have two bonds, all right, between two carbons in their carbon chain. Whilst our kind, they have a triple bond between two carbons in their chain. 
And because they all have, all our kings have this, and all our kings have that, and all our kinds have that, we can put them into a class, or a group of compounds, or a group of hydrocarbons. And those two or more atoms, which are covalently bonded, which are unique to them, forms what you call the functional group. All right, so uh, in human terms, we can say that our functional group are our surname. We all have the surname for the same family, all right? And that is what binds us together. So for the same our kings, our kings and our kinds, what makes them unique or their surname is what we call the functional group. So in the case of the our king, it's the double bond that makes them unique. And hence we call them our kings, the in compounds. And the our kinds is the triple bond that makes them unique. And we call them the our kinds or the iron compounds. So we move on and we want to look at um, the, the next set of compounds. All right, so the question is, what therefore is a functional group? A functional group, so I've explained it, and we want to look at the definition for a functional group. So a functional group is an atom, or groups of atoms attached to an organic chain. It is an atom, or groups of atoms attached to an organic chain that determines its characteristic chemical properties. So it is an atom, or groups of atoms attached to an organic chain. And those atoms or groups of atoms determine the chemical properties. So it means that when they are there, the compounds behave this way. All those, all compounds with those set of um, atoms will determine the behavior of the compound. So let's say that if we have a compound and there is an unknown group of atoms called, uh, let's say, A and B, and A and B are responsible for making the compound move sideways, it means all compounds having A and B on them will be moving sideways. So we'll classify them as a group of what? Hydrocarbon or a group of organic compounds. So that group of atoms that determines the chemical properties of a given organic compound is what we call the functional group. And it is the functional group that brings about various classes of what? Compounds. So we say that these atoms are a group of covalently bonded atoms determines the various organic all right, groups. So if you hear of any group in chemistry, it's because they have a unique group of atoms we call the functional group, all right, the functional group. So let's look at examples of class of organic compounds and their functional groups. So here we are going to look at classes of compounds, all right, and why they are called this class or what makes them that class. And that is what we are going to look at in our next table. So for this two column table, we have the organic compound and their functional group. Our canes, we said they don't have any functional group. The only thing that we use in characterizing them is the carbon to carbon single bond. Well, our canes have only carbon to carbon single bond. But we say that they don't have a functional group because the carbon to carbon single bond is not unique to only them. You can have it in our canes, you can have it in our kinds and other hydrocarbons, all right? So it is not unique to only our That's why we say that they have no functional group. Our kings, on the other hand, have two carbons separated by a double bond. It's only our kings, all right, that have this uh, functional group. So anytime we come across an organic compound having two bonds, all right, uh, between two carbons, then that compound is an alkene, all right, it's an alkene. However, if you have a, tri a triple bond or three bonds between two carbons in a chain, then we say it is an alkyne, all right? It is an alkyne. We don't only have hydrocarbons, as in alkane, alkenes, alkynes. We have other, all right, classes of compounds, all right? We'll be looking at them. So we'll be looking at alkanols, esters, no, alkanoic acids. We can have esters. And um, well, at the SHS level, we are not supposed to go into details, all right? So we'll leave the rest for the scientists to battle it out. But alkanols are compounds with a functional group OH, what we call the hydroxyl, all right, or the hydroxy. It's always attached to the organic chain. And all alkanols have a OH, all right. So what we call alcohol is actually a class of compounds, all right. And what we should rather be saying is ethanol, ethanol, because ethanol is what some people have been drinking, and we have been encouraging you not to do so because excess of it can damage the brain as well as your liver. And that will mean death, okay? And um, we don't want you to die, so please um, encourage your people around you who are doing it to stop, 
because it doesn't help them. Now, arcanoic acids, or what we also call carboxylic acid in organic chemistry, they have this functional group. And you notice that for the functional group, there's always a carbon bonded, all right, covalently to um, oxygen using two bonds, and then you have a, hydrox a hydroxide. So you have a carbon, then you have two oxygen, all right, and this is what we call the arcanoic, all right, functional, arcanoic acid functional group or carboxylic acid functional group. This group of atoms attached to any organic compound makes the compound an arcanoic acid or a carboxylic acid. And that is what separates those compounds also from the other classes of uh, organic compounds. However, we have acyl alkanoids, all right, acyl alkanoids, what we call esters or perfume, all right, they have this wonderful smell, so esters. And esters are similar to the alkanoic acids, you will notice by the portion of it is attached to an alkyl or an aryl group, then you have another group here attached coming from an alkanol. So we'll look at it as we move further. But in a condensed form, they have this um, functional group or structure. The RD stands for a part of the molecule which is yet to be defined by that compound, all right? So it could be an alkyl group, I'll be talking about alkyl groups very soon, or an aryl group. Um, as the SHS integrated science, we don't do much on the aryl. So the science students, we wish you all the best. We want to see you learning more about these organic compounds. These are not the only functional groups, but for the SHS integrated science, we'll be considering this. But the science students, you are supposed to do the ethers, all right, the thiols, all right, the amides, the carbonyl compounds. We are looking at um, aldehydes, or what we call alkanals, um, and they have ketones, what we call um, alkanones. You are supposed to do all those compounds, all right? So we wish you all the best. We know you'll be performing well and make us proud. So we have these as the functional group of those classes of compounds. So here we can say that for organic compounds, we can put them into classes based on a certain group of covalently bonded atoms. We have the hydrocarbons, and under the hydrocarbons, we have our canes, our kings, our kinds. Then we also have alkanols. What makes them unique is the presence of the OH attached to the organic chain. Then we also have the alkanoic acids, also called carboxylic acids, and they are characterized by the carbon, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen, or carbon to oxygen, hydrogen bond attached to the organic chain. Then I also mentioned esters, esters. All right, so now we want to look at arcane. So now we are going full throttle, arcane, okay? As, as far as our time will permit, we'll, we'll do what we can with arcane. So we know that they are hydrocarbons. That's one we have established, that they contain carbon and hydrogen only. But our kings are different from our kings, and our kings are also different from our kinds. So what therefore are our kings? Our kings are a class of hydrocarbons with the general molecular formula Cn H2N plus 2. Well, sometimes when we are talking about this, then we are wondering what kind of uh, long formula is that Cn H2N plus 2. So it means that it is a class of compounds containing an unknown number, n number of carbons. But for every n number of carbons, you have twice the n plus two hydrogen atoms in the compound. So we start by saying that our case are a class of hydrocarbons with the general molecular formula CnH2n plus two, where n is the number of carbons in the compound and two n plus two is the corresponding number of hydrogen atoms. Remember, the n here is a number of carbon atoms, so it should be a set of what, counting numbers. Start from one, two, three, four, five, um, up to positive infinity. So n is a set of counting numbers. That is one, two, three, four, five, etc. All right. Uh, our case are saturated hydrocarbons, and I have explained why they are saturated hydrocarbons, with each carbon surrounded by four single covalent bonds. We said if a hydrocarbon has carbon surrounded by four single covalent bonds, then that hydrocarbon is saturated, we said that. And arcanes are unreactive compared to the arcanes and arcanes. Arcanes are less reactive, okay? So they are unreactive compared to the unsaturated hydrocarbons. They therefore do not undergo addition reaction. It means that 
if you have the RK, you cannot add another compound to form a single product, all right? But you can replace some of the hydrogen. So the at, uh, in electric chemistry will tell you that they undergo substitution, free radical substitution reaction. So they therefore do not undergo addition reaction, which is characteristic of unsaturated hydrocarbon. So for the saturated hydrocarbon, they don't undergo addition reaction. But for the unsaturated, they undergo addition reaction. I'm sure by now you are getting a difference between saturated and unsaturated. So for the saturated, all carbons are surrounded by four single covalent bonds. But for the unsaturated, the carbons within the compound are at least separated by multiple bonds. You could have a double or a triple bond. Another difference between saturated and unsaturated is that the saturated undergoes substitution reaction, but the unsaturated undergoes addition reaction. So we continue by saying that the arcanes, they therefore do not undergo addition reaction, which is characteristic of unsaturated hydrocarbons. They, however, undergo substitution reactions, like I said earlier. Saturated hydrocarbons are very reactive and hence decolorizes bromine water or acidified potassium permanganate. What do I mean by this? This is chemistry, electric chemistry. Now you see, if you dissolve bromine in water, bromine, bromine gas, all right, uh, or bromine liquid in water, um, it gives you this yellow color, similar to, the color is similar to methyl orange, okay? Now, if you add it to an arcane, the color changes to colorless, and we say the bromine water has been decolorized, all right? And bromine water can be decolorized only by unsaturated hydrocarbons. And the same applies to acidified potassium permanganate, all right? That is uh, KMNO4. KMNO4 is purple colored, but if you add it to, if you add a small sample to a large amount of an, uh, unsaturated hydrocarbon, it will also have its color uh, removed. So it changes from the colored to the uncolored, okay? Now, our case cannot decolorize bromine water and acidified potassium permanganate, all right? Acidified potassium permanganate. So if you are giving two compounds, an arcane and arcane, and they ask you which of them will decolorize potassium permanganate, then you should know if they are arcane or they are kind because of the unsaturation in them. Arcanes have no functional group, but are characterized by the carbon-carbon single bond. We said it earlier, and we know that the carbon-carbon single bond makes the carbon tetravalent. It's only surrounded by four, all right, single bonds. Now, arcanes have low boiling points and melting points. I think we mentioned that that difference between organic and inorganic uh, compounds. So they have low melting points. They also have low boiling points, okay? You, you only apply small heat and then they, they melt. Let me give you an example of a typical arcane around us. That is a candle wax, all right? If you apply small fire, you see it melts. It has a very low melting uh, point. However, their boiling point increases with increasing carbon chain. So that means that as you add more carbons to the chain, you are increasing surface area. You are increasing what you call intermolecular bonding, all right? The strength of the intermolecular bonding. And the melting and the boiling point will also increase uh, for you. But for the lower arcanes, they have low melting and boiling point. And the same also applies to the higher arcanes if you are comparing them to other compounds. Now, at this juncture, they will pause because they want to move on to the second part of um, the class where we'll be looking at questions. And in our next class, we'll continue with the arcanes and how to name them how to name them. So in, don't miss our next class. Uh, go online, go to uh, Joy Learning TV. You always see um, the ads and other things flying all over. So when we come back, we shall continue with this wonderful class. Don't go away.
are you in basic four, five, or six? Hop onto the Joy Learning Vehicle and enjoy a free ride with no stress at all. Our sweet English facilitator, Eva Brobe, will help you understand the English language with no worries. IT guru, Peter Asamoa, leaves no topic unturned in ICT. Our ever entertaining Emmanuel Kweisi Adi has the key to your mathematical problems. All these programs come with no cost at all. It is absolutely free. Yes, you heard right. It is free. If you miss out on any of our TV lessons, you can access them on our YouTube channel at Joy Learning. For more updates on our programs, follow us on our social media handles, Twitter, Facebook at Joy Learning TV and Instagram at Official Joy Learning TV. Did you know that examination or practice can lead to poor grades? As a result of this, you will lose trust in yourself and will not be able to perform well in any future assignments and tests. So, I'm here to give you simple tips on how to avoid examination or practice. So let's talk about the do's in examination hall. One, bring everything you need into the examination hall. It may sound simple, but a lot of stress can be avoided by making sure you have everything you need to do in the exam. Make a checklist the night before each exam, then go through it before you leave home, and then again before entering the examination hall. Two, read the whole paper before writing anything. One of the most important exam preparation tips to dwell in during the run-up to exam. Read every question before you start writing anything. Don't get starting straight away. Read the paper from the start to finish at least once before you begin writing. Three, do the easiest question first. There is no reason to do the question in order they are printed in the exam. Firstly, getting the first question done well will help you calm you and get you focused for the rest of the exam. Secondly, often you will get an easy question done quicker, so you will be ahead of schedule from the start. 4. Revise, revise, and revise again. The night before the exams is not the time to be trying to get your head around new concepts. Some students read and forget part of the information during exam. This is why you have to keep revising till the day or morning of the exam. This is one of the steady habits of highly successful students. Once you have become so conversant with your revisions, little or a slight pause will only be required for you to recollect the appropriate information. 5. Ask the invigilator questions. If you are stuck on the meaning of a word, or can't understand what a question requires you to do, put your hand up and ask the invigilator who is supervising the exams. More often than not, they will help you or point to you in the right direction. Six, look at the marking scheme. Keep an eye out for the marking scheme that shows how many marks have been awarded for each part of a question. If there are only small amounts of marks going for a part of a question, Refrain from giving it the majority of your time. Instead, answer questions with higher marks. 7. Cross-check answers. You must check all answers before submitting your answer sheet to the invigilator. You should keep the last 15 minutes before the final bell to cross-check your answers. A thorough revision of every answer is necessary as it will help you to identify the errors and make the necessary corrections. 8. Think about the consequences of malpractice. Ever heard the saying, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom? Always remember, there is punishment for people who are caught cheating. There you have it. Believe in yourself, prepare well, and you will come out with flying colors. My name is Tina, and I am your examination coach. Keep watching Joy Learning and follow us on all our social media platforms. Till I come your way again, sign on. Joy Learning. Keep learning. Hello, welcome back to your integrated science revision show for NCHS on joy learning. Went for a brief uh, commercial break and we are back. 
and we are continuing with the second part of our class. We said today's class is segmented into three. We had the first part on organic chemistry and we treated it up to our canes. We are here to do nomenclature of our canes. And we said we were answering questions after which we bring the problem of the day. So we are moving on to the part two, which is on answering of questions. Remember, we looked at what is expected of us for integrated science exam. And we said that we have to complete the syllabus and we also have to look at gray areas, all right? Question areas which have been coming and uh, we'll be also trying to solve a lot of them after which we'll also try to look at certain topics uh, that students are not able to cover. That is why we did organic chemistry as part one. So in our next class, next and final class, don't miss it because we'll be doing the nomenclature, that part that they've been asking you to name compounds and people begin to see once more. It's not that difficult. So let's go right away, part two, integrated science, questions and answers. And after this, we'll open the phone lines for students to phone in and present the answers for the problem of the day. To call a friend, to call a friend. And if you missed out on the first part, you can still assess this information on Joy Learning TV at YouTube or any of the social media handles. You can get Joy Learning TV. Every information you want to do, you can download, you can watch. And then if you have a question, you can still send it there to we'll address it. So let's move on to the second part. It starts with a question, and it reads, figure two below illustrates four steps. Figure two, there's a figure coming, all right, uh, which illustrates four steps taken to perform a simple experiment to determine the density of an irregular solid. Study the figure carefully and answer the questions that follow. So let's look at the four steps and then we'll answer the questions that follow. So I'll give you 10 seconds to observe this diagram carefully and then we'll follow the steps and we'll answer the questions that follow. So look at step one, step two. So step one, there's an irregular object on a scale. Step two, you have water in the Eureka can. The Eureka can is the one with the spout. Okay, so you have a spout. There's a spout. And then step three, the irregular object was attached to an inelastic thread and gently lowered into the Eureka can, all right? Or um, if you don't have a Eureka can, you can also use a benzene cylinder. But we are following this question. We are not altering it. And the last one is where water uh, water came out of the spout, all right? So you have water flowing out of the spout. And the collected water was poured into a measuring cylinder to know the exact volume of this object placed in the water. So I'll give you five seconds, wake up your thoughts, and let's answer the question that follow. All right, so I believe you have looked at it carefully. Now the questions that follow. Name the pieces of apparatus used in each of steps one, two, and three. So it means we'll have to name these apparatus that we use in the experiment. Describe briefly each of the four steps. And I think I was doing that for us analyzing the diagram with you. Then see, I record the readings in step one and step four. And see, I, I hence determine the density of the solid A then the last one, state two precautions to be taken when performing such an experiment. And the last one, state two precautions to be taken when carrying out the experiment. So for the step one, we have a weighing balance or scale. All right, so we had the object sitting on a scale and they were measuring the mass. And then for the step two, we have Eureka can or what you call the displacement can, also known as the overflow can. So if you write Eureka can, or displacement can, or overflow can, you get a full mark for this question. And step four, remember when the water uh, was displaced from the Eureka can, it was collected in the container and poured into a measuring cylinder. So the last one was a measuring cylinder. You can see it's a measuring cylinder because it has this long tube and it's also graduated. So you can see it's a measuring cylinder. So you just have to write a measuring cylinder and you are there. Now describe the steps, so description of steps. So step one, 
using the weighing balance to determine the mass of the irregular object. So we use the weighing balance. We place the irregular object on the weighing balance to know the mass because we want to find the mass. And remember, to calculate density, you need mass as well as volume. And what we did then in the next step is to determine the volume by displacing the exact volume of that irregular object, collecting the water, and measuring the volume using the measuring cylinder. So step two, fill an empty Eureka can with water, an empty Eureka can with water, all right? Fill an empty Eureka can, an empty Eureka can with water to the spout, all right? With water to the spout. Then in step three, immerse the irregular object in the water in the Eureka can. So you have the Eureka can, the water has been filled to the brim where the spout is. If you put any other object inside, it's going to display the same volume all right, of water. So the water flows into the container, they collect it, and then they measure the volume using the measuring cylinder. Because it's an irregular object, that's why we use that indirect method. Now put a container under the spout to collect water that drips from the spout. And the last step, that is step four, pour all the water that drips into the measuring cylinder and determine its volume. Right, so we pour all the water into the measuring cylinder. And then CI, step one, mass of solid equals 66.0 66 grams. So let's go back and look at the diagram and check if the mass given there is actually 66 uh, grams. The last time I showed you how to do measurements, and I said that if you've forgotten how to do, do readings, all right, on uh, scientific equipment, I, I explained that. So you can go on my Joy Learning uh, or Joy Learning TV. I have those videos there. So enter measurements, calculations, all those measurements, all those uh, uh, information is there. The videos are there. You can watch it again and again and again. But let's look at this reading. If you check this calibration, it's been divided into major and minor division. So we have one, two, three, four, five divisions. So if we start from zero, we have five divisions up to the 50. That means that if you divide the 50 by five, you'll get 10. And that means that every major division there is 10. So we have 10, 10 here, you have 20, you have 30, you have 40, and you have 50. So that means that this should be 60. And if you count the divisions between the major and the minor, so let's do the counting here, one, uh, let me highlight it so that we can all see it. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five. So in between the, the two major divisions, we have five. And that means that if you divide it, you are going to get two. So every division is two. And that means we have two, four, six. So from here, which is 60, we have 62, 64, 66. So the mass of the irregular object placed there is 66, and the unit will be grams. Now, if we do same here, we can also calibrate. So let's look at the next question, all right? Uh, the next question. So we have to, we have to measure also the, the volume of this irregular object. So the volume of the water displaced was poured, or the water that dripped out of the spout was poured into the measuring cylinder, and um, it was measured. So over here, if we are to continue, again, you have your, so again, we are moving on to our next, our next slide. So we have, you have five, you have 10, and then you have 15. So again, you have to look at the two main divisions and count how many subdivisions there are, all right, between them then you can also further recalibrate the divisions. So let's move on to the solution. Okay, so step one, mass M of solid was 66.0 grams. That is what we saw. And then the measuring cylinder was 12.0. Let's go back again and look at the measuring cylinder. All right, so measuring cylinder here. Okay, so if we look at it carefully, you will notice that these are the major divisions. So this is a major division. That is also another major division. But in between them, you have 10 calibrations. If you count, you will see you have as many as 10. So you have one, two, 
3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. So it means that every division between 5 and 10, if you subtract the 5 from the 10, you are going to get uh, 5. So you divide the 10 by the 5, and you are going to get what? 2. So that means that you have 2, 2, 2, and on and on and on. So this becomes what? 2. So you add it, it becomes your 12. So let's go. And then we have the solution there. So that means that the measuring cylinder had 12.0 centimeters cubed. 12.0 centimeters. So like I said, if you don't know how to do this, we have done uh, a class already on this, and it's on YouTube um, at Joy Learning TV. You can have measurements and calculation, graphing, everything is there. And it will guide you to successfully present your practical works and attract mass. So we know that density is given as mass per unit volume of a given substance. So you divide the mass by the volume. Remember, the mass is the one we measured using the weighing scale, and the volume is the one we determine using the measuring cylinder. So you have to divide the mass there by the volume. But remember the units. If you are using grams and you are using centimeters cube, then the unit will be grams per cm cube. But if the in this case, the question didn't specify that we should calculate it in kilogram per meter cube. But it is always nice or it is always prudent to use SI units, kilograms. It means you divide the mass there by 1,000. And then you also do the same to the volume, all right? You divide it by 10 to the power 6, all right? So that becomes a million. And then you can get your measurement. Or you can multiply this by 1,000, and it gives you the answer in kilogram per meter cube. If you multiply this by 1,000, you get um, 5,500 or 5,500 kilogram per meter cube. So let's look at the precautions. Look at the diagram once again, and then we'll look at the, we'll look at the precautions. You want to determine the, the mass of an irregular object, all right? And in doing so, you have decided um, to use a mass measuring equipment or the scale. So you drop it on the scale. That means that you don't just have to carry the irregular object and dump it, just strike it on the scale. And then also when you are lowering the irregular object into the Eureka can, you don't also throw it violently because some of the water will splash out and it will affect your volume reading. And that means that your density will also be affected. And whilst transferring this, what, this amount of water into the measuring cylinder, make sure you transfer maximum amount of it, all right, so that um, you can have the volume properly uh, measured, all right. So when we're able to get a, we will look at the, the various solutions. So let's look at the precautions. So tie a stone firmly with a thread, all right? You tie the stone firmly with a thread, and then ensure that water drips out of the spout of the Eureka can when it is filled with water, all right? So when you are filling the Eureka can, make sure that a portion of the water you are pouring in there drips out so that you have it level. They can discard that one, then you start to experiment. So avoid spillage when transferring the displaced water, like I said, because it will affect your volume readings and that means you will not get the accurate density for that irregular object you want to determine its density. Ensure that water stops dripping out from the spout before a container is put under it to collect the displaced water or gently lower the stone into the water. So that means if you finish filling the Eureka can with the water and you want to start the experiment, make sure the excess water has actually flown out. So when you finish before you put the container below, and then you gently lower the irregular object into the Eureka can. Then you can transfer that volume of water for, measure, for, for measurement. In some experiments, the measuring cylinder is even directly placed under so that you don't have any transfer. Once you transfer, some of the water clings to the inner walls of that container. And that affects the, the density slightly, so it introduces error. Okay, so avoid splashing of water from the can while dipping irregular solid into it. So that means that you don't, you don't violently throw the irregular object into the Eureka can. You gently lower it, gently, meaning you hold it gently, and it enters into the water, all right? You don't use violence to do that, just very calmly. Now, take all readings at eye level. 
all right, take all readings at eye level to avoid errors due to parallax. So as you are doing your reading, sometimes when science students come to the lab, it's very interesting. Somebody is reading uh, something on the bridge, the bridge is far below the eye, and the person is still looking down. Okay, your, the eye is not as far, so the person has far, because you can have refraction, and that means you can't see the reading, so you need to bend down. Your eye level must be the same as where you have the pointer, or where you have the level, then you can continue with your reading. So take all readings at eye level to avoid errors due to what we call parallax. Mm -hmm. The emerging cylinder should be on horizontal surface. If you are doing volume reading using the emerging cylinder, the cylinder must sit on a horizontal surface, not a crooked or a slant surface. Otherwise, you can't get the actual volume. All right, well, a portion of it will be up, a portion of it will be down. You don't know where the minister, the bottom of the minister is sitting. And the last one is check the zero error of the balance. Remember the balance we showed was um, uh, the old one, all right? So we always have to use the zero error. Even with the digital ones, we still have zero error, depending on which objects we're placing on them. So when you turn it on, you allow the, the balance to settle and check if it is exactly on the zero mark. If it is not on the zero, it means it has some zero error. You need to factor that in, in your calculation. I think this question is very, very interesting. And it is a question hasn't been coming for a long time, so we have just revised it. Mm -hmm. Question number two. Study carefully the cups illustrated in figure three and use them to answer the questions that follow. So we are going to be giving a set of cups, all right, and we'll use them to answer questions that follow. So let's look at the cups they have given us, all right, the cups they have given us. So we have A, we have B, we have C, D, E, and F. Um, look at them carefully, all right? A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then we'll look at the questions that follow. But I think A looks like cassava. I'm not saying that it's cassava, but it looks like we answer the question, coquayam, they can have beans, all right? They can have E looking like maize. Then you have the onion. Sometimes we know when they draw the diagram, it's difficult to also identify them because it may look like something else, but try your best to link it to the little things you have studied in integrated science and get your marks for that. All right, so let's move straight away to the set of questions following that one. So the question A says that identify each of the crops. You see, so I say me, I don't know, but it means you must know. All right, identify each of the crops A, B, C, D, E, and F without reason. So you should be able to identify them without giving any reason. Sometimes they will let you identify them and you should be able to state why you said this is that. All right. Uh -huh. So B, assign each crop to its class according to its economic use. What uh, class it belongs to, all right, based on what it is used for. And then I, I state one feature which is special to the classes to which each of the crops C and E. So we are going to look at the crop C and the crop E. We are looking at this crop, and we are looking at that crop. Remember, beans and you have maize. All right, so we move on. Belongs to. And C, what planting materials are used to propagate each of crops A and F? So let's look at the planting materials used for crops A and then crops F. Remember, cassava, and you have the onion or the shallot. Okay. So what planting materials are used to propagate each of crops A and F? And then CII, describe briefly how crop A is propagated. We are looking at the cassava, all right? How it is propagated using planting materials you have given in I. So how do you propagate it using the planting materials that you have identified above? So let's look at the solution to this question. Very wonderful question. So identification of the crops, like I said, A is cassava. B is coquayam, C is cowpea, or beans, or soya beans, all right? So if you mention cowpea, or beans, or soya beans, you will score all the points. You are identifying them without a reason. And D is granite, all right? But if you look at D carefully, it's a bit difficult to identify. See, granite, sometimes these diagrams are a bit difficult. But what is making us identify as a granite is if you check below the soil, there are some pods, all right? And that makes it a granite. So 
look at the plant, you must, even though you are supposed to identify it without a reason, you must be spot on, be able to get the answer correct. So here, you must give the right name, right? But you're not supposed to give the reason, unless the question demands that you supply the reason. So D is granite, and then E is maize or corn, all right? Maize or corn. F, like I said, is onion or shallot. F, onion or shallot. So let's look at the class of each crop. The class, you know, crops have been grouped into classes, so we are going to look at the various classes. Cassava, we know, is a root tuber. All right, cassava is a root tuber. And uh, we get the, the substance, the food items from the root. So it's a root tuber. Then we have uh, B, which is cocoa yam, being the corn. So we have the corn. Then C, all right, C, cowpea is a legume. All right, it's a legume. Then granite is also a legume. All right, leguminous, le leguminous plant, they, they supply nutrients into the soil. They're able to fix nitrogen. So legumes, and then cereal, maize, or, um, yes, so maize or corn is a cereal. Remember, sorghum is also a cereal. Wheat is also a cereal. So sometimes they could vary them, but it's just maize or corn, and they are cereals. Then the onion, we have the bulb. The onion, we have the bulb. So the question went on to demand that we provide the special features of crop C and E. And we said the crop C, all right, was a cow pea. The cow pea and E is a cereal. So we are going to look at their special features. Now, crop C has nodules on the root, all right? It has nodules on the root. And the seeds are contained in fruits called pod. So you notice that with the, with the granite, you have um, the, the pot down there, all right? Uh, I think it is rather the, the beans. Let me check so that we can. Uh, so C is beans, so they all have pot, all right? They have pot. Um, so C has nodules on the root, and then because it's a leguminous plant, they have nodules on the root. And the seeds are contained in fruits called pot. So you take the beans, you break the pot, and then the beans comes out. Now, fruit splits longitudinally along two offset lines on the pot. It is one way of dispersing the plant. They use what we call the explosive mechanism. So you have on, on you have a uniform drying of the two sides of the pot, and that brings about the treating and the eventual splitting of the pot for the seeds to be uh, uh, to be thrown out, and you have the seeds uh, disperse, all right, the seeds disperse. So that these are the features. Now with C again, it stores foods in the seeds, or what you call the cotyledon, all right? It's a dicot, so it has uh, seeds, uh, food stored in the cotyledon. Now in the case of E, which is the cereal, it, it has grains of fruits, uh, the grains of fruit serves as a store for food or starch or the endosperm. So when you take um, a corn and you cut through it, you see some large white portion, the endosperm. That is where carbohydrate is stored, all right? So grains of fruit serves as a store for food or starch or the endosperm. Now, stem grows vertically upward. So in the case of the cereal, you see them growing vertically upward, all right? And the presence of leaf sheet. Now, when you, take a, when you look at a particular um, corn or maize plant, the leaf has some small wraps. Uh, it has this small sheet that wraps around the plant. All right, so the leaves have what what you call the leaf sheet. And then you can also have presence of fibrous root. Every corn plant or a uh, maize plant has its root being fibrous. It spreads around. All right, it doesn't go deep. One what you call the tap root. They have what you call the fibrous root, and it's because they are what you call the monocotyledonous plant. All right, monocot, they have that feature. Now, male inflorescence is at the top, while female one is at the axle of the leaf. So if you look at the maize plant, the male part is at the top, the, the one that tassels at the top. Then the female part grows at the, um, in between two leaves, so at the axle, all right? And then gradually it grows into the main cone. You see these hairline structures? That is what I'm talking about. Now, let's look at the planting materials for CI. 
All right, so see, I planted materials that are used to propagate crops A. Remember, A was the cassava, all right? And then the F was the, the onion or the shallot. So the planting materials used for crops A and, and, and F. So A, we use the stem cuttings. To plant cassava, you use the stem cuttings. And to plant bulb, uh, to plant the onion, you can use the bulb or the bulb cuttings or seeds. Now, technology has helped that. So we have seeds, you can even use a tissue culture to do that. So how crop A, that is how cassava is planted or propagated using the stem cuttings. So planting materials are cuttings consisting of two or three internodes or two to six bud. So you take a, 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 a stem cutting, and when you cut, there should be some internals. You see some swelling. You see some small leaf projections hiding there. It's the starting material you can use to plant cassava. Then, cuttings are obtained from a mature plant of the stem. So it means that you cannot take the, the heart of the, the stem that is not mature, the greenish part that is very soft. It cannot grow to give you the cassava that you want. Cuttings are planted by laying co-cutting or part of the cutting into the soil. So um, on the farm, you can if this is the stem cutting, you can dig a hole and put the whole stem in it and cover it. It will grow and you'll get your cassava. Or you can you can point the lower point, the look the lower part, the lower portion in the soil, and you have the the shoots coming out, right? So don't go and turn it. Sometimes uh, if you don't, if you've not been going to the farm for a long time, and it's your first time, they ask you to you see whilst everybody is planting vertical, you alone is the other way around. So the 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 plant begins to germinate, and it's ha it has to also germinate and come up again. Sometimes the plants end up dying. So cassava sticks, all right, is cut into pieces, and that is what we use. Question number three. The questions are exciting, and we feel we have enough time to finish everything, we are just playing. Figure four is an illustration of a set of glassware used in the preparation of exactly 100 centimeters cube of 1.0 molar solution of sodium chloride in the laboratory. Study the figure and the information below carefully and answer the questions that follow. So we have been given this figure and with this figure four, you have A, B, C, and D. In 2021, uh, Chief Examiner's report, we noticed that students are not able to even link these equipment. So I spoke about them the last time, learn about the usage of uh, laboratory equipment, particularly for chemistry, and how they can be used to do setups, setups for gas preparation, preparation for preparation of solutions. Please learn them, all right? Because uh, it's a worry now. Sometimes students are not able to identify. You draw a, a simple setup for them, and they give wild names. <laughs> it doesn't exist. So like I said, one way of overcoming that is to create for yourself a picture album. So if you learn about preparation of, say, carbon peroxide, you draw the diagram into a book, and anytime you are going to sleep, maybe give you some 10 minutes to look at the diagram and the part. And if you draw another one, all right, you keep adding. So by the time you finish school, you have a picture album. If you are not able to do that, then take time to look at the setup so that you'll be able to identify the parts. And when you are giving those single equipment to join them, you should be able to do so without a problem. So this figure here, you've been given uh, a volumetric flask, that is A, you have a measuring cylinder, and you have a beaker as well as a glass roasterer. Let's look at the questions that follow. The capacity of A is 100 centimeters cubed. Remember, A here is a volumetric flask, so that means that it's a 100 cm cube volumetric flask. That's what the question is now telling us. Okay. B contains distilled water. So let's look at B again. B here contains distilled water. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the capacity of C. So C contains, um, we'll be back in a very short time. My name is Joanna Pedo, oral health officer with Military Hospital and Emmanuel Community Hospital. 
Your oral health tip for today is brush your teeth regularly, flossing every other day. Use soft or medium brushes. Use toothpaste that contains fluoride in them. And change your brush every three months. And visit your dentist twice every year. Treat your mouth well so that your mouth will treat you well. It will enhance your self-confidence and help you eat and grow well. My name is Joanna Mapedo. This week on Joy Learning, basic classroom lessons are from Monday to Friday at 4.30 p.m. with a repeat at 6 o'clock a.m. and 9 o'clock a.m. Monday, basic 6, ICT, component of the computer system. Tuesday, basic 5, math, numbers and numerals. Wednesday, basic 6, science, mixtures and their uses. Thursday, basic 4, ICT, part of a personal computer. Friday, basic four, English language, using quantifiers to show quantities. JHS1 lessons are from Monday to Friday at 3.30 p.m. with a repeat at 6.30 a.m. Monday, mathematics, decimal fraction. Tuesday, RME, Islamic worship, part one. Wednesday, social studies, adolescent reproductive health. Thursday, English language, informal letter, friendly letter. Friday, French. JHS2 lessons are from Monday to Friday at 5 o'clock p.m. with a repeat at 11.30 a.m. Monday, Math, Statistics, Part 1. Tuesday, ICT, Integrating ICT into Learning, Part Welcome back, and um, thanks for standing by. So we were looking at the question, and the question reads, figure four is an illustration of a set of glasswares used in the preparation of exactly 100 centimeters cube of 1.0 molar solution of sodium chloride in the laboratory. Study the figure and information below carefully, and answer the questions that follow. So that is the figure they gave us. We have a volumetric flask, a measuring cylinder, a beaker, and then a glass rod stirrer. <coughs> now the capacity of A is 100 centimeters cubed. B contains distilled water. C contains weighed amount of sodium chloride. All right, and the molar mass of sodium chloride was given as 58.5. So here, B contains distilled water. Let's go back and look at B. And remember, B is a measuring cylinder. Okay. <coughs> C contains weight amount of sodium chloride. So we go back again and look at C. So what we have in here is the sodium chloride which has been weighed. We have also been given the molar mass of um, the sodium chloride as 58.5. The relative molecular mass is actually 58.5, but the molar mass should have a unit of grams per mole. Okay. <coughs> Identify each of the glass words A, B, C, and D. And then B. Read and record the volume of distilled water in B. So it means that we'll have to go back <coughs> and read the volume here. By now, you are all experts of um, reading of volumes or measuring and uh, reading uh, things on the uh, scientific equipment. So determine the mass of sodium chloride in C for the preparation of the 1.0 molar sodium chloride solution. And describe how 100 centimeters cubed of the 1.0 molar solution of the sodium chloride is prepared using the materials provided. And then the last question, determine the approximate volume of distilled water that will remain in B after the <coughs> preparation. So we, are, we move on right away, identification of the glassware. So we said A is a volumetric flask, all right? It's a volumetric flask, but remember the capacity is 100 centimeters cubed. And then B is a measuring cylinder, C is a beaker, and they have already weighed a certain amount of salt. <coughs> D is a stirring rod or, or glass rod stirrer. Glass rod or stirrer, any of them will fetch you the mark that you need. And then B, volume of distilled water in B is 145 centimeters cubed. So let's go back and check the measurement. <coughs> so for the measurement we have here, look at it carefully on your screen, and now agree with me that it is actually the value that has been quoted, all right? 
so we can move forward, we can move forward. If you miss any portion of this class, like I said, you can assess the information on Joy Learning on YouTube. All right, on YouTube. <coughs> All right, so let's move on with the, the, the answer. So the volume of the still water in B is 145 centimeters cubed. And then C, determine uh, determination of the mass of sodium chloride. So here you have 100 centimeters cubed equals the 58.5 grams, all right, in the 100 cm cube. So that means that you are going to convert the centimeters cube to decimeters cube and you do so by dividing by 1,000. Now, whatever you get there, you multiply it by <laughs> the mass they have given us, all right? So if we continue, that is going to give us our 5.85, all right, the 5.85. Okay, it's the same as the mass by the molar mass and volume. All right, mass over molar mass and volume. Okay, so we move on, and then uh, B equals, <coughs> the D question read, how 100 centimeters cube of the 1.0 molar solution of the sodium chloride is prepared? How you prepare 1.0 molar solution of 100 centimeters cube capacity, all right, in the lab? So we start by, you know, if you want to prepare any solution, or you want to fry me an egg, you, you stick to equipment, and then your vegetables, and you go to the procedure, is what you are going to do. So over here, <coughs> We have to add sufficient amount of distilled water in B. Remember, there was distilled water in the measuring cylinder to the sodium chloride in C. All right. So you pour some of the um, the water, the distilled water in the measuring cylinder into C because C contains the waste salt to dissolve it. But you shouldn't go beyond the hundred because the capacity of the volumetric flask is hundred. Add about half of the hundred, which will be fifty. You stir it with a the stirrer, then you transfer. <coughs> So stir thoroughly, all right, <laughs> stir thoroughly, excuse me. Transfer the solution into A. So after stirring, you need to transfer the solution into A, and then rinse it with more distilled water, and transfer it into A. <coughs> Mix and shake well the solution in A. Add more distilled water from B to 100 centimeters cubed mass in A. So we'll go on to the next question which demands that we should calculate the volume added. So you subtract the 100 <coughs> from the 145, and that gives you 45 centimeters cubed. Question four. <coughs> Question four. <coughs> so in an experiment, five different volumes of water at 62 degrees were allowed to cool to 27 degrees Celsius. They were then weighed separately Figure 4 shows the five volumes, V equals V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5 of water at 27 degrees Celsius and corresponding masses, M equals M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5 of water, and the measuring cylinder. Study the diagram carefully and answer the questions that follow. <coughs> so showing on your screen is the figure. All right, so you have some mass in this measuring cylinder, and then they added water to it. And we are supposed to measure all of them. So take your time and do your readings. I'll give you 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Okay, let me give you 10 seconds. I know you are very fast. So 10 seconds. Then um, we'll continue with the preparation. Look at the volume reading on the, on the stem of the measuring cylinder. <coughs> and look at that of the scale, all right, also the mass. So we are going to do that together. So we then record the volumes V1, V2, V3, and uh, V4, V5 of water shown in the figure. Read and determine the masses of the volumes of water in A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, D, and E, given that the mass of the empty measuring cylinder is 50 grams. So here, without anything, the mass of the measuring cylinder is 50, means you'll be subtracting. Let's go. If the specific capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, <coughs> calculate the heat losses in kilojoules in each case. And then D, tabulate your results in A, B, and C. Now, this is where sometimes we have the problem. Plot a graph of heat loss on the vertical axis against volume of water on the horizontal axis. So you can have your vertical being the y, 
and then you can have the horizontal being the x. <coughs> Draw the line of best fit for the points you have plotted, and then G, determine the heat loss for water whose volume is 30 centimeters cubed. So if you go through the set of values that they gave us, you will notice that V1 equals 20 centimeters cubed. That is, if you measure the volume V1, V2 will be 25, <coughs> V3 was 19, V4 27, and V5 13. The corresponding masses were also given as 20. Then you can have 25, then you have 19, then you have 27. Then you can also have the 13. So I hope you have observed the trend of values on the screen. <coughs> well, so heat loss Q is given as MC change in temperature. All right, so heat loss is always given as MC change in temperature. In some books, <coughs> It is captured as Q equals MC change in theta. So the change in theta is the same as change in temperature, okay? The change in theta is the same as change in temperature. So for A, you are going to have the mass, which we measure to be 0 0.02. We need to convert it to kilogram, and then you multiply it by the 2000, uh, 4,200. And then the temperature change of 35. Remember, the temperature change was constant for all of them. So we measure the temperature change and you multiply. So for A, you get 2.94 kilojoules. All right. And if you do the same for B, you get 3.68 kilojoules. All right. Um, 3.68 kilojoules. <coughs> now C equals 0 0.019. All right. Times the 4,200 times the 35 degrees Celsius, which was given as a change in temperature. So if you multiply, you are going to get 2.7994 kilojoules. <coughs> and the D gives us the 3.987 kilojoules. Now when you finish multiplying the mass, the heat capacity, and the change, uh, you are going to get a certain energy change. And that's what we are going to use to plot our graph. So now, D. So we have A, B, C, D. The volumes given are 20. 25, 19, 27, and 13 centimeters cubed each. <coughs> the corresponding masses that were given, if you should do the measurement on the front of the scale, on the face of the scale, you get 20, you get 25, you get 19, <coughs> 27, and 13. So we calculated the heat losses, and we noticed that we had 2.94. 3.68, 2.79, 3.94, and 1.1 kilojoules, respectively. Now, if you put it in a tabular form, it makes it easier to understand. Okay, so let's look at the, the tabulated uh, data. So for A, for A, we had 20 centimeters cubed, 20 grams, and the heat loss when we calculated was 2.94. For B, the same, you have 25, 25, and 3.68. So that goes for the rest of the information given, okay? <coughs> okay, so for E, we'll have 13, 13, and the rest. 13, 13, and 1.91. 13, 13, and 1.91. Okay, so now let's look at the graph. Take a careful look at the graph. I'll give you 10 seconds to do so, so that we can comment on this graph. <coughs> Okay, so this graph <coughs> is a graph of heat loss against the volume of water. And you notice that as the volume of water increases, you also have the, the energy or the heat loss also increasing. 
Plotting of graphs is very simple. You only need two axes, and you have to choose a very good scale that will spread the point more than two thirds of the page. I've spoken about it again on graphing with integrated science. You, if you go to YouTube, you will get it on Joy Learning TV. It is there. <coughs> so when you plot this graph, you must have the point along the line. Okay, and when you finish, you use a very straight line, uh, a straight edge to join all the lines. And then from there, you label, remember to label your axis. So you must have your axis labeled here, all right? <coughs> you must have your, excuse me, you must have your axis labeled here. And the line will go through the points as shown on your screen. So now we tackle the other part of the question. From the graph, heat loss for 30 centimeters cube of water is 4.4. Let's go back and check. So for 30 centimeters cube, we are looking at here. You draw a straight line to meet the graph, and then you read the corresponding value on the vertical axis. All right, so you draw a straight line to meet the graph, and you read the corresponding value on the vertical axis. So this brings us to question number five. Very soon, we'll be opening the, the phone lines so that you can present your um, so, so that you can present your um, answer to the problem of the day, okay? So we'll be opening the phone lines very, very soon. Um, for question five, in an experiment to investigate the process of photosynthesis in aquatic plants, the setup below was used. The setup was placed in the sunlight for two hours. Study the diagram in figure one carefully and use it to answer the questions that follow. <coughs> So we have this setup. You need to look at it carefully. You want to find out the, the, the effect of sunlight on the time rate of what photosynthesis. And you can do that by using any aquatic weed, all right? And then you allow sun to shine on it. Or you can use even a bulb, all right? And measure the distance. There are so many experiments on this. So look at the diagram carefully, and let's answer the questions that follow. So name the parts labeled I, 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 and I. Let's see the parts. Okay, so we, we'll go back and we'll look at the parts I, 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 and then gene. Name the substances that occupies the parts I. So let's go back to the parts I. Remember, it should be oxygen. Describe briefly how the name substance will be tested for. You want to test for oxygen, what do you do? You use a glowing splint, you light a match, turn off the flame, and send it close to the source of oxygen. It will rekindle again, and that is how we test for oxygen. But that is where you have oxygen in small quantities. If you don't go and then you are not careful and you go and light, it will explode, all right, and it will burn you. <coughs> so why is pond water preferred to tap water in this experiment? Why is it that we use pond water and not tap water? Why was the setup exposed to sunlight? So we are going to answer the questions that follow. Give two precautions to be taken when carrying out this experiment, and then suggest an aim for the experiment. So let's look at the answers. <coughs> so II, per the diagram, is the boiling or the test tube, and then II is bubbles of air. IV is trough or beaker or suitable container. All right, so you have a, a container or a trough. Then, you, then V is panel. We inverted, we inverted the panel and we placed the, the, the test tube over it. And I, BI, is the oxygen. We are producing oxygen. One byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. So that's what we are, we are, we are capturing or we are, we are trapping to measure how fast the reaction is proceeding with respect to the presence or absence of light. So I, I, how do we test for it? So to test for the name substance, dip a glowing splint into the test tube. It rekindles or bursts into flame, indicating the presence of what? Oxygen, so like I said earlier. And then C, tap water contains chemicals or chlorine, which might damage or kill the plant. So if you use tap water, because of the presence of chlorine, the plant will die and you will not get the oxygen. So you will not get the desired results for this experiment. So we prefer the pond to the tap water. And then D, sunlight is necessary for photosynthesis. All right, that's why uh, we use the sunlight. Precautions. The setup should be airtight. Remember, you are producing oxygen, so it should be airtight. 
the plant should be completely covered under the water or avoid trapping air bubbles under the test tube. So it means that the, the plant should be totally submerged so that the, the oxygen coming will, will just float, go through the funnel and be collected uh, in, at the upper part of the boiling tube or the test tube. And the appropriate aim will be to show or demonstrate that oxygen is given off or produced during photosynthesis. The questions are quite many. We cannot exhaust all today. So we are going to open the phone lines for the third part of today's class. Remember we said today's class comes in three folds. So we have part one being organic chemistry, which has been cleared. Part two, we've discussed some questions we couldn't finish. The next time we meet, we'll add more. And then part three, our problem of the day. So problem of the day, the phone lines will be open and you have problem of the day. <coughs> So on the screen, the problem of the day, you can answer the question to us at 0302-211-705. 0302-211-705 or 706. So the producer will put the question there, problem of the day, and we will move on right away to solve our problem of the day. All right, so Derek, you are welcome to Integrated Science uh, Revision Show for SHS. Yeah, yeah. So we lost Derek. <coughs> the line is still open. You can still call or phone in and present your, your answer. So it is a question on respiration and it is asking us to use an experiment to show that carbon four oxide is needed for the is carbon four oxide is a byproduct of respiration. So the question read follow of the day describe a single experiment to show that expired air contains carbon four oxide. It's a very simple question. So the question is there answer and get our award. If you don't answer we'll keep it. It will keep building, so we have the problem of the day. Yeah, the numbers to phone in through um, is 0302-211-705 or 706. It's showing on your screen. Stand somewhere, call, turn off the volume or turn down the volume of your search and then talk to us. <coughs> So if you are not able to answer, the first person that gets the question correct wins the award and the producer will talk to you uh, afterwards. So problem of the day. Describe a similar experiment to show that expired air contains carbon four oxide. Contains carbon four oxide. So I just supposed to describe an experiment and in your experiment, you should be able to show that the air that you are expiring, you are exhaling, you are breathing out, contains carbon four oxide. Well, so we've been waiting. No solution is coming. We pray that. So we'll solve the question right away as usual and we'll keep the reward. So to show this, the list of apparatus required, you, have, you need a bell jar, bottle, three conical flasks, delivery tube, small mammal, or a mouse, you can use any other animal that can produce substantial amount of carbon dioxide for you. Then you need a suction pump. <coughs> and a list of chemicals, you use sodium hydroxide, lime water, and a Vaseline. All right, and a Vaseline. So showing on your screen is the setup, a very simple setup. You need two, you need three conical flasks, A, B, and C. And with A, you connect all the conical flasks to delivery tubes and a rubber tubing so that you can easily do the pulling of the air. And then you need a suction pump, something that is going to draw the air from this side. So you have the air coming through here. Okay, now let's look at the procedure. 
The apparatus is set up as shown below. Three conical flasks A, B, and C. A bell jar D and a suction pump are assembled together using a delivery tube and a rubber tubing. The conical flask A contains caustic soda solution. Flask B contains lime water. The suction pump is connected to flask C and atmospheric air enters flask A. Then moves to flask B and from there it enters the bell jar and finally reaches the sea. So the idea is that the air coming out may contain some amount of CO2 gas or carbon monoxide will be trapped by the sodium hydroxide. And as it moves further, if, that, if, it, if you still have some, it's going to show in the lime water by changing to milky. All right, then the air moves finally to the organism or the mammal in the bell jar. Because it is, exp it is, um, it is respiring, it will take in the fresh air and bring out carbon dioxide. And when the suction pump is further pulled, it is now going to change the last lime water in the conical flask C. All right, milky. So observation, the lime water in the flask in which the exhaled air bubbles turns milky, indicating that it contains carbon monoxide. But the, <coughs> but the one in which the inhaled air bubbles remains clear indicate, indicates absence of what? Carbon monoxide. This shows that exhaled air contains large amount of carbon monoxide. So all too soon, our time is up today. We studied three parts of our class. We did the class, we did three parts. We did organic chemistry. We answered some few questions and we presented the problem of the day. With organic chemistry, we define what organic compounds are. And we said they are compounds that contain carbon, except carbon peroxide, carbon, uh, metallic carbonate, metallic bicarbonate, and cyanide. And we said there are different types. You can put them into classes based on their functional group. We went on to say that we have a class called hydrocarbons. They are a group of organic compounds containing carbon and hydrogen only. And under the hydrocarbons, we have arcanes, arcanes, and arcanes. We started with the arcanes, and we said they are a class of compounds containing carbon and hydrogen with the general molecular formula CN, A2N, plus 2. All too soon, our time is up. In our next and final class, don't miss it. I am George Loco, your facilitator from St. Mary's.